I told you he'd be Bach. <laughs> if I didn't have dumb jokes, I wouldn't have any jokes. <laughs> this summer, we have been using Diana Butler Bass's book, A People's History of Christianity, The Other Side of the Story. And today, we are finishing up with the Reformation. Wow, you guys have had a survey class in church history this summer. I should say, actually, we are finishing an unfinished Reformation, for that is what Bass repeats numerous times in her book. The Reformation of the Church, started by Martin Luther on October 31st, 1517, is, in many ways, unfinished. Now, part of the reason for this is that humans often say one thing and do another, and the institutions which are made up of humans the churches, the apprentice lodges, the chapter houses, the banks, even the various monarchies around the globe often talked the talk of Reformation but failed to walk the walk. Their words and their actions didn't align. They were unable to be whole. Their ethical and moral systems failed because of that disconnect. When Philip Jacob Spainer, a Lutheran minister, pined for a truer reformation, he stated, It is not enough that we hear the word with our outward ear, but we must let it penetrate to our heart. He believed that the problem with the Protestant church was that the clergy cared more about theological purity than the idea of a universal priesthood for all of God's people. Leaders worried more about the teachings of the church than loving God and neighbor. Reverend Spainer reminded his audience that it is no means enough to have knowledge of the Christian faith, for consider, uh, Christianity consists rather of practice, and that love is the true mark of a follower of Jesus. So as we prepare to enter into modernity next week, the question then becomes this. Is our greatest commandment, the one where Jesus says we must love God and then neighbor, is that commandment enough on which we might build a set of ethics? Or do our ethics require something more permanent, something less subjective than love? For you may find that you believe that you love God and neighbor just fine, whereas someone else may find that your love of God and neighbor is insufficient. Love is subjective. So as Church reformers in the middle of an unfinished reformation, what should we base our system of ethics upon? Well, perhaps it might be helpful to spend a few moments with this idea of ethics, what they are and what they're not. In our Christian tradition from the time of Pope Gregory the Great to the nailing of Luther's theses on that cathedral door, ethics had been tightly connected to and controlled by the church. Until Martin Luther challenged the status quo, ethics and the clergy went hand in hand. During this time, the ethical life was more a sign of salvation than a condition for it. It was often performative, for show. Sound familiar? So after Martin Luther shook things up, ethics became one of those tricky issues that it was going to require a new foundation. And Luther points us towards this great Protestant idea of the rugged individual, and our ethics then will need to reform to match that new, more self-centered approach to theology. Ethics then became no longer a matter for the church so much as they became a matter for the individual sitting in the church. You know, I have many people in my life who believe that you can only be an ethical, moral person if you're a Christian. They think that non-Christians or the unchurched, as they often call this 
group of people. They think that non-Christians lack a suitable foundation for an ethical life. But we know this is patently false. Ethical people walked the earth long before Jesus of Nazareth. And there are ethical Jews, ethical Muslims, ethical Buddhists, you name the religious group. Ethics is not dependent upon Christianity. But in fact, it's probably the other way around. Christianity is dependent on a solid system of ethics. I think Bill Moyer says it best when he says this, our very lives depend on the ethics of strangers and most of us are always strangers to other people. All right, there are three classes of ethics. We're gonna look at the, the science of ethics here for a minute. Some big words here, so bear with me. Deontological, teleological, and virtue-based. So that first one, that big word, deontological. Deontological ethics is a system of ethics based on rules. Each of you in your professional careers were given a set of ethics to follow. Physicians and nurses have deep ethical concerns regarding the care of their patients. Teachers have a code of ethics concerning how they will conduct themselves with students and in a classroom. Business people have all sorts of rules for the ethical treatment of their customers, their employees, even their products. Deontology then is the study of duty, of our ability to abide by the rules. Our second category is teleological ethics. Now this is a system of ethics where the ends determines if our actions are just. With teleological ethics, the system itself may be ethical, but the ends it achieves might not be. As in the science of cloning, the scientists who are perfecting cloning have a deeply ingrained set of ethics that they adhere to as they perfect the science of cloning. The work as they see it is ethical, but the end result is cloning ethical? Is the end result of a clone of another creature an ethical act? And this is where teleological ethics comes into play. In teleological ethics, the rightness of the system depends on the outcome. If the end result is moral, then the ethical system that got us there is moral. You can begin to see how difficult discussions about ethics and morals can be when we are talking about significant things. War, our criminal justice system, our drug policy. All of those things may have been arrived at by a completely ethical system, and yet their outcome, the deaths of millions in each of those classes I just mentioned, death is not moral when it's caused in this way. We have to weigh these things. Then the final major category of ethics is called virtue ethics. Virtue ex ethics is person-based rather than action-based. Vir virtue ethics looks at the person's virtue or their moral character as they carry out an action. And it looks at that rather than at ethical duties or rules or the consequences of a particular act. Virtue ethics deals with the rightness or wrongness of individual actions and provides guidance on the sort of characteristics and behaviors a responsible, reasonable, good person might seek to achieve. In this way, then, virtue ethics is concerned with the whole of a person's life rather than particular episodes or actions. A good person, then, is someone who lives virtuously, who possesses and lives the virtues. But I ask you, what good is the best ethical system if you don't adhere to it? In the past decade, we have seen multiple examples of people saying one thing and then doing another. Many Christians are perfectionists. I want to use this, hold this up as an example, this idea of Christian perfectionism. Now, I don't mean that they are picky about whether or not the house is perfectly clean or that they have raised their children perfectly. 
But when we talk about theological perfection, we mean that someone has decided that Jesus demonstrated specific characteristics and traits that we should try and emulate. A doctrine was then established that for you to gain salvation, you must attempt and attempt and attempt again perfection. Many, many of our Christian brothers and sisters have weighed down their souls with a primitive idea that they could and should achieve perfection. Personally, while I believe that we should emulate the actions of Jesus, I think trying to live a perfect life is impossible. We're human. Not an excuse, a fact. Why don't we turn towards this idea? Let's live the best possible life we can using the life of Jesus of Nazareth as a guide to our ethical behavior. I think that's what Christian ethics should look like, in my opinion. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, hinted at this when he wrote, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, the rules, deontological ethics, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that's from Paul's letter to the Romans. For Paul, for both Pauls, the way of Jesus is love. Now, that might seem a little contradictory given all of the confusing things that we know about Paul, but I think that line from Romans neatly sums up Christian ethics. Studying ethical systems can be maddening especially when you start to have to deal with ethical dilemmas. Now, most of the people in this room would have no problem creating a basic set of ethics. Um, They often feel like, you know, those rules, everything I learned, you know, I learned in kindergarten. Um, They seem obvious. Play fair. Be nice. Say you're sorry. Put your things away. Use your turn indicator when you are turning. I, I think that's an ethical action. Martin Luther had two confusing principles for his basis of ethics. And if you've ever studied Luther and ethics, this might give you an idea of why it is so maddening. He says this. He says... A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. And a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Which is it? Luther insists that any tensions can be resolved through love. For Luther, works without love produce hypocrisy. So as we are going to shift our focus to the modern church, now we're going to see a turn from a motivation based on obligation, as we've seen up to Luther's debates, and turning towards a motivation then based on intention. No longer is the individual dependent upon the church for an ethical foundation. I am no longer an ethical person because of my affiliation with the church, but... I can be an ethical person within my own sense of self. I am ethical, not because of my affiliation with the congregation. It is a subtle distinction, but it is a very important one. Albert Schweitzer wrote, the first step in the evolution of ethics is a sense of solidarity with other human beings. Ethics can quite possibly be summed up with that idea of love of neighbor. Or listen to what the brilliant Catholic priest and church critic wrote. Uh, Hans Kuhn wrote these words. The real scandal of Jesus' ministry is his acts of love. In these acts of love, Jesus created a scandal for devout religious Palestinian Jews. The absolutely unpardonable thing was not his concern for the sick, 
the cripples, the lepers, the possessed, nor even his partisanship for the poor, humble people. The real trouble was that he got involved with moral failures, ethical failures, with obviously irreligious and immoral people, people morally and politically suspect so many dubious, obscure, abandoned, hopeless types existing as an eradicable evil on the fringe of every society. This was the real scandal. Did Jesus have to go so far? What kind of a naive and dangerous love is this which does not know its limits? The the frontiers between countrymen and foreigners, the boundaries between party members and non-members, between neighbors and distant peoples, between honorable and dishonorable callings, between moral and immoral, ethical and unethical, good and bad people. As if disassociation were not absolutely necessary here, as if we ought not to judge in these cases, as if we could always forgive in these circumstances. That's hard to hear on a Sunday morning. I've said it more than once this summer. I said it already three times in this sermon. We are heirs to an unfinished reformation. The work that began on the steps of that Wittenberg Cathedral is still ongoing, and you are participating in it every time you are here. There are still tensions between many branches of Christianity because we can't even agree what we disagree on. Church historian Richard Lovelace believes that Christianity should be a generous way of life a process of ongoing personal and communal reformation centered in the love of God. Reforming doctrines and institutions in the church was futile unless people's lives were reformed and revitalized. Lovelace insists that the Reformed Church must always be reforming. Lovelace was interested in what happened after Luther. When Martin Luther died in 1546, Protestants, bless them, we began to fight over the particulars of our revolutionary movement. The second generation leaders wanted theological clarity, don't we all? And they demanded it. And they wanted church order. They wanted the church to be ordered in such a way that it reflected back to the world their love of God. The new Protestant groups, the Lutherans and the Calvinists, began to fight among themselves, even while they together were debating the Roman Catholics and the Anabaptists. As Diana Butler Bass writes, instead of experiencing the word as fluid, Protestant leaders made their faith rigid concretizing the passions of their ancestors into dogmatic intellectual systems. They fought real wars like the English Civil War and the Thirty Years' War. They fought those wars over words. Professor Lovelace adds to this conversation when he says that by the end of the 16th century, Protestants in both Lutheran and Reformed spheres were already referring to a half Reformation, which had reformed their doctrines, but not their lives, their head, but not their heart. And you remember what Heidegger says about the greatest distance in the universe, the distance between your head and your heart. Christianity will go on to struggle between the head and the heart. Orthodoxy and piety had been severed. So do you remember Philip Jacob Spainer, that Lutheran minister from the beginning of the sermon? Remember what he said about the clergy being more interested in theological purity than the universal priesthood of all believers? Well, he also tells us that our convictions, our ideas, our statements of truth are not faith. In fact, he said those convictions are far from it. Instead, true Christianity is the practice of love. There's that subjectivity again. 
and the Orthodox Church attacked Spainer precisely because of the subjectivity of love. His theology is questionable because of this, and it weakened the ecclesiastical authority. Spainer was accused of taking the Reformation too far. Jesus took his idea of love too far. Both men's ideas were too radical for the existing religious institutions of their day. But I have to ask you, what sort of a Christianity would we rather have? One based in dogma and creeds and strict adherence to a set of rules, rules created to amass power and control for the church? Or would we rather have a Christianity that compels people to act in love? I know my choice. Do you know yours? How might you act in love today? Whose life will you change by your simple act of kindness? How will you continue to pour your love into this world, a world so desperate for that love? How might you be a follower of the way of Jesus in the world today? Here's a conviction for you. I have faith that you will do so with love. Love of God and love of those crazy people next door. As Paul said to the church in Rome, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Go and prove him right. Amen.